Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on this uh, Zoom event from the Coalition for National Infrastructure Bank, Restructuring the American Workforce in a Time of Financial and Economic Turbulence. My name is Alfeka Mutardi. I am a macroeconomist. I worked for 25 years at the International Monetary Fund, and now I am the lead economist on this National Infrastructure Bank proposal and what it does from the economy side of things. So we're going to have several great speakers today to talk to you about the workforce and the crisis. <clears throat> but I'd like to set the table a little bit by uh, talking about where we are on the economy and also where we are with our workforce. And I wanted to make sure that I mentioned to you that uh, the this particular bill in Congress to create a $5 trillion national infrastructure bank has legislation ready to go to get it into the next session of Congress. We're actively looking for a Republican uh, to co-sponsor our bill along with Democrats who have sponsored it before. The legislation is essentially the same. It creates a $5 trillion bank to in finance infrastructure projects all across the country in every single corner of America put 25 million workers to work in great paying jobs, and we'll have to provide and train them all up to do those jobs. And in addition, uh, we wanna make sure that um, we have enough money in this bank to cover everything. The uh, If you wanna know briefly uh, or in depth how the National Infrastructure Bank works, there are several videos on our webpage, nibcoalition.com to explain that, but briefly, this bank works exactly, even though it's a public bank, works exactly like a commercial bank does, although it lends only for infrastructure projects all across the country. And it does that by getting itself capitalized from the private sector, from treasuries that the private sector is holding to capitalize the bank. And then it goes on to give out loans exactly like a commercial bank does. And when, when it's doing that, it's adding to the money supply, but it's growing the economy much, much faster. And so actually it turns out to be deflationary for the economy. So where are we with the economy? Um, I'll pull up a few slides and um, um, make a presentation of where the economy is as of March 16. We have inflation falling, but it's still high at 6% in February. So as a result, um, that high inflation has hit the lowest income earners the hardest. Rents are now hitting in, being folded into the CPI. Teachers, for, a, for example, uh, who earn less than most people with an equivalent educational degree can't even afford to live in areas where they teach. Many Americans are housing insecure, just a paycheck away from being evicted. And so they are in desperate need, even though we have tight labor market and full on, a full employment, they are just a, a, a desperate, um, a, just a paycheck away from getting uh, evicted. And they're really struggling to make ends meet. So we have low unemployment, and yet we have 10 million job vacancies. Uh, but as I said, inf uh, inflation is um, still high. Uh, if you measure, uh, and they have inflation has risen faster than wages have risen. So while we have 6% uh, uh, inflation right now, you can see that the wages for everyone are coming down, um, uh, even though they were uh, rising uh, uh, last year. So if you look at uh, a new measure that is out to assess how the workforce is, is doing, uh, it's very well captured by a, a measure by um, Mr. Oren Cass from uh, Florida, who who said uh, who measures something called the cost of thriving index that measures how much a person needs to work, how many per weeks a person needs to work in order to support a family of four um, and pay for the basics like housing, education, health care and college education. Back in 1985, that person had to work for 40 weeks. Uh, that means that person had 12 weeks left over to spend on other things other than essentials. But by 2022, that person had to work 62 weeks. That means they were 12 weeks in the hole. And that means that somebody else in the family needed to also work or they needed to work two or three jobs. Uh, and as I said, we have 10 million families that are housing insecure. Now, in today's uh, picture of high inflation, we have a reckless Federal Reserve policy to try and tamp down on this inflation by raising interest rates. 
and with the purpose of putting people out of work. So we will have, uh, on account of this inflation, many more people, um, maybe as many as 2 million people, uh, increased uh, work uh, un unemployed in the uh, coming year ahead. And the Federal uh, Reserve Chair Jerome Powell has doubled down on this uh, and has uh, um, both on February 7 and March 7 said we will keep on the course of raising interest rates until they see the inflation turn uh, downward and the unemployment turn upward. So this is going to crush small businesses, uh, state and local finances, the banking sector, the stock market, and it won't cu cure the problems of inflation, which are on the supply side. Too few houses, too few affordable houses, and too uh, uh, and food uh, prices that are spiking, including on account of drought in the Southwest. So what does the National Infrastructure Bank do to address all of this? It works very similar to a previous bank in our nation's history called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, uh, which was used in the Great Depression and World War II, although we had three other banks in our nation's history going all the back, way back to the Revolutionary War. It creates a, like the RFC, it creates a very large infrastructure bank to lend for projects all across the country and complement the federal budget. And this NIB does not need any increase in taxes from the federal government uh, or increase in spending. So it should appeal, it's, a, it's passable legislation because it should appeal to Republicans, fiscal conservatives. Uh, it promotes the general welfare, much like Alexander Hamilton's First Bank of the United States did. It builds things that people need, housing, power, efficient transportation, clean water, connectivity. Uh, it leans against any recession that's coming our way because all of these unemployed people can be hired up quickly to build our construction projects all across America. It will make America make again, to borrow a phrase, uh, get manufacturing built and running in the United States for the construction inputs, and that will have a lot of secondary growth for the whole economy. It's an investment in the real sector, unlike what the banking sector has been doing. It'll vastly stimulate production and supply. And for goodness sake, let's build affordable housing so that people are housing secure. So that's the uh, state of the economy. Let's look at the state of the financial system, which is in very much disarray. This is, uh, we've had two banks now closed and taken over by regulators, um, uh, Silicon Valley Bank in California, and first um, something or another bank in uh, New York. And this is a line of people outside of SVB Bank uh, trying to get their deposits out. What happened was the Federal Reserve policy caused these crises by raising low, low short-term interest rates fast and pushing long-term interest rates back down so that banks are not able to make money because they make money off the spread, the spread of the interest rates that they lend at and that they must pay to get cash in the bank to uh, circulate money through the banking system. So the Fed has actually caused this uh, by their uh, interest rate hikes. They're going to keep on doing it. Quantitative tightening has lowered liquidity in the banking system. Uh, Moody's, uh, as a result of these two bank closures, uh, changed its rating on the entire U.S. banking system to negative from stable. Uh, and Credit Suisse, which is a, uh, the, the second largest bank in Europe, uh, Swiss bank, uh, and has um, branches here in the United States, uh, is also in further distress. We probably haven't seen the end of uh, this, this fi financial crisis. And why is that bad for the economy? Because if we have a financial crisis, in addition to a normal recession, this makes the recession even worse. It gets the recession is longer and deep, uh, longer in length and deeper in scope, and more people are put out of work, and that means that we're going to have much higher uh, unemployment caused by a financial crisis. Which means what we will need this National Infrastructure Bank even more to lean against uh, an, any coming recession. So that's where we are in the economy. Where are we on the uh, the late the workforce? Uh, we have two aspects to the workforce. First of all, we've had a lot of people drop out of the workforce, not just on account of COVID. Here's what the uh, participation rate is. That is the rate of people working that are in the age group eight, 18 to, to 64. 
uh, and it has uh, fallen precipitously on account of COVID, recovering a little bit, but you can see that it's been declining ever since the 2008 recession. And this is because it's difficult for people to work. They, they can't even afford almost to work uh, and that's why they're dropping out of the workforce. There's 3 million that have dropped out altogether. So that's a source of employment for us. We wanna attract those people back into great paying jobs. Here is a, a chart that shows where people are that are working, what occupations are they in? And they are in the millions in low paying service jobs. For example, this is a uh, retail, uh, retail and supervision, cashiers, food uh, and, and um, cashier workers, uh, office clerks, um, uh, stackers and off sh on shelves. And we have ed everything in the service industry is, um, is represented here. And we want to restructure the American workforce, get these folks, maybe carve um, a, a million off of each one of these, get more robotics in, uh, to do their, their, their kind of clerical work, if you will, and get them into great paying jobs and train up. Um, most of these are low paying jobs and we want to get people into better paying jobs. So we have an, a, an objective of um, not only solving unemployment, but restructuring the American workforce. And this just goes to show you how we can attract those workers into these great paying jobs. And the answer is simple, pay them well. Robert Reich, who used to be the uh, labor secretary under Obama, said the reason people aren't working is that work doesn't pay them enough. And given the declining wages and the increasing cost of housing, child care, elder care, transportation, uh, if you want to attract these people, then just pay them well. Here is a comparison of different occupations uh, compared to the construction industry. Uh, these are the top the top 10 jobs with similar education requirements. And what you can see is the construction industry pays by far much better than any of the others. These are all equivalents of high school diploma or less. And this is the best kind of construction jobs. Uh, the fact that the National Infrastructure Bank will be permanent means that we can have a long standing financial institution to, um, to reliably provide credit over a long period of time, won't be subject to the ups and downs of budgets or anything like that. And uh, we can pay these people Davis-Bacon wages, which are high prevailing wages, and put them into great paying jobs. They'll have full benefits and they'll be fully employed in our economy. But we will also have to train them up well, and that will be a, a large challenge uh, we have several, I, it'll be all hands on deck to do this training. And here are the ways that we can do it. First, through union apprenticeship programs. Uh, the North America Building Trades and other unions provide registered apprenticeships. Uh, people can start working right away and earn while in an apprentice program and earn while they learn. Other side uh, programs that the, uh, the unions have are helmets to hard hats and trade orientation programs. So that's on the union side. On the federal uh, budget side, there are a, quite a few training programs that the federal government uh, operates and finances, a career one-stop shop. You can look online and find these. Community workforce development. Uh, many communities have their own workforce development programs to link up workers or unemployed workers or people that are just coming out of being uh, unhoused uh, with uh, training programs, with community colleges, and with the uh, private sector and the businesses out there and the workers that they are demanding so they can hook them all up again into a one-stop shop. Several cities have programs like this. Two-year community colleges are very much picking up their the pace on providing training. Here's an example of a community college in West Virginia that provides a degree in electrical and power transmission. That person earns $80,000 in their first year right out of a two-year degree. Uh, more than twice the median income of a bachelor's degree. Uh, we, uh, we find that um, uh, there's a lot of federal money going to these two-year colleges, but it needs better coordination. A study by Brookings Institute uh, and Harvard and some others finds that we need better coordination to make all of these programs work better. And then career and training technical education in high schools. And just to show you how this can work, uh, here is a picture of my daughter. 
uh, who got a two-year degree at the age of 50 uh, in electricity from San Diego Community College. Then she went back to her home country where she lives in, in the Netherlands uh, to get a, a job working for the largest construction company. Now she's working for the electric companies that run the uh, glass farming district that produces uh, hydroponic uh, agricultural products and exports them all over Europe. It's the, uh, they produce more agricultural output per acre than any place on earth. And she provides all of the electricity and does the hookups for these new um, for these new power structures. And they're very integrated and very uh, uh, economical and ecologically friendly way to grow food. So just to show you how it can work, we'll get a new supply of workers, as I said, from people in these low paying jobs, working age workforce dropouts, that's three million of them underreported and rising unemployment. A lot of people can't report that they're unemployed because uh, they, they're, again, they're housing insecure or, or, or homeless. And then ex-offenders, ex-military, immigration reform are all sources where we can get uh, new workers to come into these great paying jobs. So thank you very much and thanks for listening.